Thank you very much to the trial court organizers and to this illustrious crowd for giving me the opportunity to address you today. My hope is to talk about simplicity, not complexity. We, we go on and we spend time on Twitter and everybody and his dog is a complex PCI operator. And I hope that by the end of this, I've convinced you that complexity means that you're doing something wrong. And the idea should be everything is simple. These are my disclosures. So what's this? We have a group of very experienced operators in the car. What is this? This is what we do in PCI, right? We take shards of data, pieces of things that we recognize, and we use the construct in our brain to try to create a picture that we understand. And from that picture, we make decisions about people's lives. When in reality, it's probably easier if we turn on the lights if we start to make connections, get additional information so that these are no longer inferences, it's just the picture that you need to be able to interpret. So what are the actual goals in PCI? What is it that we aim to achieve? Well, any procedure that we do, once we've decided the patient's going to benefit, we wish to achieve patency. We need that result to be reasonably efficient and reasonably effective in reversing the problem, which is a lack of blood flow. We need that result to last, right? So we want efe patency, efficiency, durability, and then arguably most importantly, we want safety. We don't want our patient to leave our cath lab worse off than when we found them. So what's the formula for success then? If we're going to use intervascular imaging, if we're going to turn on the lights and commit ourselves to getting additional information so that we're no longer guessing, but instead we're making sense of data, what we do is an image, let's say it's Ivis in this case, and what we get from that is the ability to see the anatomy of what we're treating so that we're not guessing, we're interpreting data. And from that anatomy, it tells us what kind of tools we're going to need and what kind of techniques we'll require to be able to achieve the goals that we've set out to achieve, which is patency, efficiency, durability, and safety. So, Let's make this real. This is a case I did two weeks ago, okay? This is a 76-year-old guy, South Asian, like many, uh, like virtually everybody in the crowd, presenting with a non stemi and heart failure. He had baseline CCS class three and was treated on medications for quite some time because of this concept of renalism, where individuals with chronic kidney disease don't typically get referred for invasive angiography out of a fear of complications as a result of the angiogram and the intervention that comes behind it. He has the usual cardiac risk factors in an EF of 42% following a non stemi that occurred some years ago. He also has a renal transplant with a failing graft and a creatinine of 3.1. And his baseline functional status is that he's an important guy to his family. He's a primary caregiver for his wife. So this matters. This was his diagnostic ad. You can see that this is a diffusely calcified, severely diseased RCA. And the wall motion abnormality was inferior. So it was thought that some of the myocardium that this subtended may not have been viable. And then this is the circ and the left main, or lack thereof, right? It's effectively two osteo severely calcified lesions, one in the LED ostium, one in the circumflex ostium, and then you see this circumflex sort of subtotal CTO type of lesion, which has got a good deal of calcification throughout the entire body. So one of my partners ended up taking this patient onto the table, and we did the get out of trouble intervention, right? This patient was unwell, he was having at rest symptoms, and he kept getting into heart failure. So there were two high pressure NC balloons taken up. There was ultimately an ultra high pressure NC balloon taken up here to see if we could get good expansion. And then after setting up for SKS, because this patient effectively had no left main, there was a deployment, optimization, and that's a pretty good angiographic final result. Does anybody disagree with the fact that this is a good angiographic final result? Well expanded, good flow down both branches. This guy's out of trouble. 28 cc's of contrast to do that, not too bad. So good job, right? So then he comes up to me and he says, can you take care of his CTO using an ultra lower zero? I said, sure, nice result. What was the MLA or what was the MSA in the circ and the LAD? And what I heard was, dude, I, ha I remember this forever, dude, I have Ivis eyes. Besides, the angiogram looked great. I just needed to get him out of trouble and I knew you'd be bringing him back anyway. So this is the danger of the optimal angiographic result. Because what we look at is a luminogram. 
This is an LED, it looks pretty good angiographically. But let's take an IVUS catheter and let's put the IVUS probe where we indicate and start to pull back. And here's what you see. You see a really well expanded stent, but then you see this. You see a crushed stent because the front end was abluminally wired when post dilating. And then you have no stent beyond that but disease. The danger is that the angiogram is a luminogram and it doesn't actually give us all of the information that we need to achieve the results that we've set out to achieve. Now, why do these things happen? It's because by definition, angiography isn't giving us the same amount of information as angiography plus intravascular imaging. And what we see is that even though luminal volume on IVUS and angiography are correlated, the correlation is certainly not perfect. And it becomes more and more important the larger the vessel gets. As the vessel gets larger, your ability to fully expand the stent to be an appropriate size becomes a larger and larger, larger influence on the outcome. And so when we size stents, this is based on heuristics, right? This is based on what we're trying to achieve without achieving trouble. But which way do we end up expanding things? Or which way do we end up sizing things? This is based on behavior and circumstance, right? Somebody's in trouble, you just want to get them in and get them out. So what are you going to choose? You're probably going to choose a strategy that is conservative. But what we notice when we do that is that typically we undersize. We make things smaller. And because when you put a stent in, you remove the ability of the vessel to respond to vasodilators endogenously, you have suspended this vessel in this size. And I'm sure that this vessel is perfectly fine when the patient's at rest. But what about when they get up to go for a run or run from a lion when they're at the zoo? Right? These, are, these are the types of influences that actually matter when it comes to the quality of life gains that are so clearly demonstrable with PCI, whether it's stable ischemic heart disease or ACS. And so we do get an early win, but at what cost? Do you oversize, do you undersize when you use angiography? So when we think about the actual goals of PCI, and we touched upon them a little bit during the case this morning, it's all about the largest MSA you can get without injuring the vessel. So we start with a vessel, then it starts getting narrower and narrower, but the vessel positively remodels, and only when it really can't remodel anymore do you start to encroach. It's called glide off remodeling, which is why it's so important to recognize that what you're trying to achieve is an area that is as large as the nearest normal segment, because that's how big that vessel needs to be to create physiologic equipoise with what the patient needs. So do you want to guesstimate then, which is what we do with angi angiograms, or do you want to measure? Well, here's the problem with guesstimation, right? We look at it and we think to ourselves, well, how long is the lesion? And then we start thinking, what else do I need to do to understand the plaque? Then we go, well, what's the vessel size required? And then, geez, is there a side branch? Do I need to wire it? Where do I land this? How do I modify the plaque? Is the lesion prepared or do I need to do more? Is it going to be one stent or is it going to be two stents like the overlap we thought might be necessary this morning? This is cognitive load. This is what makes procedures unsafe. It forces you to do 20 things at the same time when what you're really trying to do is one thing well. And this is where intravascular imaging adds to the picture, where it lends clarity to ambiguity. So what's the usual complex case solution then? Just stent it and get out, right? Well, here's what I submit to you. If you're doing a complex case, you're doing something wrong. Because complexity involves making assumptions and guesses, whereas simplicity is just collecting data and using those data to make a series of simple decisions. The vessel is a 4-0, so how big is the stent I want to put in? I'll put in slightly lower. The vessel distally is a 2-5, how big is the stent I want to put in? It's going to be a little bit less than 2-5. The plaque is calcified, I'm going to need to atherectomize because it's in the surface. These are simple decisions, but what you've just described is a, quote, complex lesion. And so what we need to recognize is that, in fact, what you're trying to achieve is simplicity not complexity. So here is the next intervention for this guy. This is the zero contrast intervention, right? What are the decisions to be made when we look at this? 
What's the anatomy? I mean, what was the previous result like? Where's the OM osteum located if I'm not going to be able to take a picture? What are the tools I'm going to use? Am I going to need a pointy wire, a slippery wire? I'm going to need an angled microcatheter, or a straight microcatheter. How am I going to stent it? Especially given that I'm not allowed to take puff, 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 what's the bifurcation strategy I'm going to use that's going to be least risk with most likelihood of efficacy? And then when I stent it, how am I going to make sure that it's perfect? Because that's what we're trying to achieve for our patients. So let's start on this road. If we're going to start on a road of a complex case, let's try to take complexity and make it simple by simply turning on the lights so that we can actually see what's in front of us. So this was the initial wiring. I threw a wire down the circumflex, and then with the guide catheter outside, I was able to use the old stent as a fluoroscopic marker to wire the LED. So I had wires down both things. And this was the initial IVUS. And what you'll see, I'm sure you saw it there. There was some malapposition. And then look at the old circ result. This is the acute result that was achieved in the last case. Right? What we have is gross malapposition underneath the stent which is just proximal to the branch. And you also have a relatively poor expansion of your osteocircumflex, such that when I was delivering the IVUS catheter, it was hard to get it there. I remember that specifically. But thankfully, you have natural reverberations, which means that this is relatively thin calcium. And so you're not going to have to do anything overly difficult to get this to expand fully. So what were the decisions that I had to make? And how did the IVUS change my ability to make the decisions? Well, now, instead of the angiogram, which looked perfect, I know that there was malapposition, which I couldn't see. And I know that there was a narrowed lumen that I didn't know was there. So I defined the anatomy. There was severe malapposition distally. There was an area of underexpansion proximally. It was due to calcium, but it was thin calcium. So I don't have to rotablate the stent out. I don't have to take contrast-enhanced laser. I won't need a lithotripsy balloon. This is something that's going to likely respond to a high-pressure NC balloon. We know that from the data. And that's why when I select pressure, or when I select tools, I'm going to go with an ultra-high-pressure balloon. And distally, where there isn't a ton of disease, I'm just going to take a regular NC balloon up gently to be able to push the struts out of the way. So that's what we did. And this is the final result that we got in the circumflex. And as you can see, this is a very nicely expanded circ now. So let's move forward, onward to the CTO. Here's what the IVUS showed us. There was a bunch of disease in the circumflex. It was terrible, right? And you'll see now there, that's the osteum of the side branch. So if we know where the osteum of the side branch is on the IVUS, we do what we did this morning, which is we fluoroscopically co-register where this all is located. And with that co-registration, we're going to know exactly where to go for the OM osteum. So what were the decisions to be made? What does the anatomy look like? Well, it's got a lot of calcium within the vessel, but it's a big vessel. So you're not going to be able to maintain any core strength on a wire if you make a big bend. That means you're going to need an angled microcatheter. There isn't a ton of disease at the immediate osteum. You'll be able to get across with a wire. I'll be down in just a moment. And so what you'll end up doing is crossing with a polymer jacketed wire and then treat the vessel like normal. And that's what we did. We used a workhorse wire to probe the tip to make sure we got into the osteum. Then we put a supercross microcatheter into the tip and we crossed with a polymer jacketed wire followed by a gyather to poke into a previously placed stent. And to plan our stenting strategy, we fluoroscopically co-registered exactly where the bifurcation was, which you'll see. We know that there's lots of calcium in here, so there's a good deal of preparation that was going to be necessary. But again, this isn't hard. None of these things are difficult decisions because we know what calcium looks like and how it responds. We know where the bifurcation is on the IVUS, so we don't need to guess where that's going to be. And having then recognized that, to try to pull out a stent strategy that's going to, likely, that's going to be most likely to not miss the osteum, we chose a two-stent strategy. You could do a DK crush, you could do a DK culotte, whatever you want. I happened to choose a DK culotte here because the IVUS told me that my side branch and my distal circumflex were about the same size. And so I was able to use similar size stents for both. And then after that was done, we optimized the result. So that's effectively what we did. Now, 
I'll get, I'll, I'm happy to share these little bits. These are, open, these are available widely, but this is just a basic workflow then of how to address these lesions. You start by measuring landmarks and length. You try to go to a healthy landing zone. This is what a disease landing zone looks like with less than 50% plaque. This is what an unacceptable landing zone looks like, where it's unhealthy. Then we define the lesion length so that we know exactly how long we're going to need to treat. Same thing we did this morning in that zero contrast case. Once again, there's no magic here. Next, we figure out what the plaque is made of. So this is mixed lipidic plaque because of the dropout versus fibrotic plaque where you can see vessel behind the plaque. There's no dropout, so it's not calcium, but it's bright versus calcium here where you can see the dropout behind the calcific curve. And then you figure out how big the vessel is proximally in the stenotic segment and distally, and you simply size your stent so that you can cover both ends of the lesion within the stent platform. So that's what we did. And we did the DK culotte. There is your first deployment, your first crush, uh, your first kiss, then your second deployment, and your second kiss. And then what did we do with our post-stent post -stent workflow? We made sure on the final IVUS that it was landing and healthy, or landing in minimally diseased, it was fully expanded, and there was no dissections. Just in the interest of time, I'll move forward. And so your final result ultimately ended up being this. So this is coming back from the circ across the OM. You can see that the bifurcation is clean. And this is coming back from the OM to the main circ. It's a pretty big branch. You can see once again that the bifurcation is clean. And that then results in this single picture final result. So this was a quote complex case. But it's not really complex, is it? It's just a series of simple decisions. But in order to make it a series of simple decisions, you need to respond to as much data as you can gather. And the data that are really going to allow you to make the decisions you're trying to make are those that you'll find on intravascular imaging. This is a quick final thought, because there was a lot of IVIS, right? So I timed out this case. Started at 1421. We defined the anatomy. That took four minutes between putting the IVIS catheter on the wire, taking the image, and interpreting it. Then we figured out what toolbox we would need based on interpreting the plaque. That took two minutes. Then we stented the lesions. And figuring out, this is not obviously the stenting time, but this is the time it took to interpret the IVUS to define the landing zones and how we were going to stent. And this is how long it took to interpret the IVUS at the end from that fourth run to figure out whether or not our results are optimized. It was a total of 10 minutes of an 81 minute case. So I ask you, what are 10 minutes of your life worth to your patient? This is why the argument of I don't have time really doesn't hold much water because our responsibility is the best job we can do for our patients. And so IVUS helps turn the complex into simple by reducing errors in measurement, by defining complexity and making it simple, by, using both measure, by reducing both measurement error and cognitive load, by simplifying algorithmic principles into application, and by adapting all of the principles that we know from good PCI will achieve good results to achieve the goals that we set out for, which was patency, efficiency, durability, and safety. Thanks very much.